when looking for the king of podcasts, you're at the wrong channel. Looking for good ideas for life, you are far from good hands. If you think the listener is always right, you are far from the right place. Hosted by a Northeasterner by birth, a rebel by choice. If you want a host that floats between love and madness, then play on and listen to Crazy Train Radio. What up? Excuse me while I whip this out. Oh, no! Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. I double dare you, motherfucker. Say what one more goddamn time. I knew it, I'm surrounded by assholes. And good evening, friends! With over 30 years of experience and a superb reputation for being a detail-oriented company, Lacey Cleaning has some of the highest work standards in the cleaning business. That's the fact! Whether it's carpet cleaning, tile, grout cleaning, new construction cleanup, rental turnovers, vent and duct cleaning, odor elimination, office and or business cleaning, power washing, residential cleaning, you name it, they do it. Check them out. To contact them today, LaceyCleaning at gmail.com or call them at 609-709-8536. That's what I'm talking about. Not all football helmets are created equal. Zenith, the industry leader in protective technology, is the only helmet in the game with adaptive head protection featuring a shock suspension system that can move independently from the helmet shell. Headquartered and developed in Detroit, Zenith is committed to player safety and revolutionary innovation. Zenith is proud to protect athletes at every level from peewee to the pros. Learn more about the Zenith difference at zenith.com. That's X-E-N-I-T-H.com. How's it going, guys? This is Amy Dumas. You guys might know me as Rita. You are listening to Crazy Train Radio. I know it seems unusual, I know I come off strange I'm too old for a toy and I'm too young to use a cane That's not to take it lightly, boy, don't judge a man too quick Just know that I walk sharply, cause I've got a magic stick, my magic stick My mighty magic stick is going to be the first nationally distributed album on a US, USB flash drive that's going to be happening on May 9th. This, this top right. single from that album is also My Mighty Magic Stick. Mark Aaron James, how are you, sir? All is well. Nothing bad's happened to me yet. Yeah, and if it did, nobody probably listens anyway, so what the <laughs> hell. Well, let's get started with the album. USB drive. You know, it's going to be distributed nationally like that. Why that concept? Well, you know, the a lot of artists have been complaining about how record sales are down. A lot of touring has become the main source of income for artists. And, and I tour a lot, but I also thought, you know, I, I have a, like I think everybody does, a stack of CDs that are doing nothing now that I've put them on a, on whatever device I'm listening to. And a lot of people are just downloading albums anyways. A USB stick is still a great, useful thing to have after you've used it to deliver the music. And uh, it also can hold a lot more music. My The physical product's going to have like the greatest hits on it from my previous albums. And it just seemed like a really convenient thing. It's easier to carry. It's shaped like a credit card. It, it had so many pluses. I was like, why hasn't somebody done this before? So here it is. Yeah, and, well, you know, you bring up an interesting part point there about, you know, CDs and, everything, how technology has changed. Uh, do you see any benefit or a positive with how it has changed where a lot of people get their music from 
Spotify or Apple or YouTube or some of the other different venues that are available here in 2017. There are some good sides of it and some bad sides of it. I think, you know, it is different in that some some really talented artist can make a video in his living room and it can be international, you know, the next day. Uh, I had a song uh, uh, on my last album that was called uh, 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 Shoot. It, was, it mentioned the Antiques Roadshow, and Antiques Roadshow Googled themselves the next day, and I got an email from the Antiques Roadshow, and they featured it on their website the next day. So a day after I wrote the song, 158,000 people listened to it. That couldn't happen in 1970. But the other bad thing is that somebody who is a great artist, who isn't very visual or isn't uh, high on the technical side, is going to find it a lot more difficult to get their music out there and, and get signed now that there are only you know, two major record companies and it's a lot harder to get record distribution and things like that. Or even make, you know, make some money on, on a record. If it's, you know, it's the best record in the world, it's not going to, not going to really be an income grabber. But, uh, it's, it's a double-edged sword. I don't know how I think about it. Uh, let's, let's see okay. how the USB I, uh, stick works, and then they'll yeah. make a decision. <laughs> okay, then, then, then we'll revisit that. You know, I'll exactly. shoot you a text. Hey, what do you think about it you know, after that weekend or a week, you know, the yeah. release? Hey, Mark, what do you think? <laughs> uh, well, I'm excited about it either way. I still get yeah, to go out there and play music for people, so I'm psyched. Yeah, you know, can't, better than digging ditches, that's for sure. Uh, that's a fact. But. And I found it interesting that you were born and raised near our home base of Orlando, original home base of Orlando, over in Cocoa Beach, but now in New York. And if I'm not mistaken, you actually recorded this uh, album at your uh, New York studio at home, correct? This is this is that's another great thing about technology these days. You know, every Macintosh computer comes with a better studio than the Beatles had. You know, so there's really no excuse not to be able to to at least get good music recorded. And, yeah, yeah I miss Cocoa Beach a lot. I go back often. Well, you know, nothing wrong with that at the east coast of Florida, for sure. Of course. But the last time I went fishing down in that, off the east coast of Florida, the only thing I caught was uh, Cubans, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> well, and I know I'll be down there for Thanksgiving, for sure, and probably down there for some for a few shows before that as well. Yeah, and I know I'll get some grief for that joke, so so be it. But uh, uh what, let's see, how, where do I go from here? <laughs> now that I was had, gave myself a brain fart. <laughs> no, no, no. All, all good, all good there. And when we tried this doing take one, I found it interesting uh, that your some of your previous music has found home or homes in other ventures, whether it be. TV, film, comic book inspired, and just other outlets. As a singer-songwriter, how is that for you when your music, which is each song or album or however you want to put it or categorize it, can almost seem like a child that there's so much labor and love and everything put together, which I like for somebody like you. When, As a songwriter, when it's always... A child is... Yeah. As a songwriter, it's always exciting. When, when when a song finds a new home or finds a new purpose, I, I love it when that happens. I, I you know, I, it's that another that's another aspect of technology too. People aren't looking at albums as albums; they're looking at you know each individual song. People can download each individual song. So you know, if I have a song called Simple Ingredients and it gets used in a cooking show, or or as you mentioned, probably my biggest song was about comic book characters, and that got picked up for a lot of a lot of people are doing cosplay to it and comic you know comic cons and stuff like that. And, they, you know, I, I never think of that when I'm writing the song, but it is pretty cool. You know, I just, uh, it was just Passover, actually, and I, I was Googling the song to put up on Facebook and saw that a, a, a cantor, the person who sings for the Jewish holidays, was singing that, the, the song about Passover that I wrote, you know, maybe eight or nine years ago. So it's just interesting to see how songs can have a life beyond what you plan for them. And I, I, I think that's great. I think it's a cool way for your music to live out there. If you so like that, keep that child metaphor going, it's, it's nice to see a child find its job. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, is that good for business that if, say, you know, a song finds a home in another outlet, whether it's TV, film, or whatever the case may be, that sales will pick up? Have you noticed I don't. I mean, certainly the the comic book song it sold a lot because it was exposed in that way. 
I, it's not so much sales that, that it, it's great business. It's that you, you know, you get residuals from TV shows, you get uh, and placements in films and things like that. And, and uh, it certainly, you know, it ups your, your visibility too. So when I'm, you know, if I'm touring to the town that, that, that cantor sings in, more people are going to see my, if they see my name in the paper, they go, Oh, that's the guy who wrote that song. So, you know, it, it, it's just like any other business, you know, it, it's word of mouth and, and exposure and, and they said that the songs are good. People are going to want to, you know, are going to find them and, and want to see the person who wrote them. So it's definitely good for business in that regard. I, I've had songs yeah. that have been in films that have not, you know, not not sold anymore. And I've had songs that have, because of a TV show or because of the, the comic book angle or, or, or the video, having the World of Warcraft video game used in it or something like that, have found in a completely new audience. So it's exciting either way. Yes, well... Back to my Mighty Magic stick uh, quickly here. Uh, I found it interesting, uh, the, the single anyway, that it had an old school, like, uh, funk kind of deal with it. And you actually had a Phil Kinzini, excuse me. Uh, Phil Kinzini, yeah. Performing it, sax, yes, uh, performing sax on it. And Phil is a legendary sax performer who's played with some of the best uh, throughout musical history. Absolutely. But, he was, you know, he was the, the sax player for the Eagles when they were on tour. He, he played that famous solo in the Year of the Cat uh, and played on lots of funk and soul albums as well. He was with Rod Stewart for many years. Great, great player. It was an honor, an honor to have him around. Yeah, and how, you know, that's got to be cool. And we were talking about this when we spoke last week and tried to take one with this. Uh, we... If you're going to go for that sound, why not have the person who created that sound there? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, that's why uh, when Shelby Lynn did I Am Shelby Lynn, she had all those Muscle Shoals players who were who played on Dusty Springfield's album. And you can hear that, you know, it's it's those, you can tell it's those guys. I love that sound, that funk horn section sound. It's so rare for me to get to... Uh, to play with a, you know, a great slap bass player and a, and a big horn section. So I also had Jason Pintar on the trumpet. So it was a real, it was a full horn section playing, playing those parts. It was, it was, it's, you know, it made me dance around my kitchen while I was mixing it. <laughs> yes, definitely for sure. The other thing I found interesting, and we're not the most political show, don't want to go there, but the other thing that I saw in my notes and whatnot and doing a little homework, because God forbid my parents wanted me to read and write and whatnot, <laughs> is that you actually performed twice for presidents, once for Mr. Obama and now current President Trump. You know, when when you got the invite for something like that, you know, what's that like uh, for somebody like you? Well, so I know the, how I'd react if I did. <laughs> I was, well, I, when I first got the Obama invitation, I thought it was, I, I honestly thought it was uh, spam. I didn't, I, it came through my spam email. You would think they would, you know, I, I always expect that people would show up at your door in, in dark sunglasses and say you've been invited to play at the White House, but but they reached me via email, and uh, but they it, it was just an email saying can you send your bio and clips here you're you're on the short list to play at the at the White House. They do a a concert there every a, a thirty Christmas concerts there every every year. So I, I sent I'll send a bio and a video out to anybody. So I did, but I didn't. I only checked my spam email like once a month. So like a month later, I checked it again, and it said, you know, you've not responded to your invitation to play at the White House. We might have to give your spot to someone else. So I, I, I actually wikipedia the email it came from to, to see if it was real. It was FOP.gov. So, uh, it, and that turns out that's from the office of the president. So I, I uh, copy and pasted the Wikipedia uh, email address into my reply and then copy and pasted the, the original email and then sent that, and they replied to that. And when they replied to that, I was like, holy crap, this, must, this might actually be real. But I wasn't sure until, yeah. until they let us in the White House. I was, I was still a little nervous that it was going to be fake. Yeah, because I know you were mentioning as well with that story. Once you got in, somebody else actually got denied access to come in. <laughs> we were... We were at the gate with a woman who had all sorts of paperwork, and she's like, I've got an appointment with one. And the, the, the guy, you know, and we, we were next to her, and the guy was like, oh, oh Mark Aaron James, come on in. You're here your band. And meanwhile, she was stuck at the door. So I was like, okay, we're, we're, we're legit now. <laughs> I feel better. Cause like I said, uh, we were joking uh, when we were talking about this the first time here, that, like, if I was invited for whatever reason to a high-functioning 
event such as that, whether it be the White House or a fancy dinner or whatever, I'm the type of guy that I'd be looking over my shoulder going, waiting for somebody to go, all right, come on, got to go, time to go. You've, <laughs> you you've know, been coming. pumped, yeah. Yeah, well, you, yeah. After the, after the dog visiting, but... our instruments twice, I figured we were we were actually going to make it in. <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, did you find they were a receptive audience? Because uh, that, that can be like a uh, higher class uh, crowd or audience at times, you know, your upper class. Well, the, the the audience for these particular shows is uh, the, the president and the congressman are allowed to invite people into the White House to see the decorations, basically. And then at the end of the tour, seeing all the decorations, there's the, the concert. Uh, so I think everybody was kind of really in a great mood because it was it was constituents and people who had you know who worked with the, the local congressmen, and they'd all been walked through this beautiful beautiful display of Christmas ornaments and and gingerbread houses and so everybody was by the time they got to us they were in such a mood to listen to uh you know christmas you know we had them singing along to things we had it was you know it was very pretty I, it was some original music and some and a lot of christmas standards as well so it was everybody was definitely you know in the spirit of the of the show by the time they got to us but did you uh you know get a chance to interact with president and mrs obama at the time or i did not i i, I got to meet the dog I got to hear him say my name, and I got to meet the dog. Uh, But afterwards, uh, Mrs. Obama wrote me a lovely note thanking me for coming. And just framed in my my apartment. Yes, that's what I was going to hit at. I would sure something like that's definitely framed. Yeah. We didn't so, we, we didn't talk about my other presidential encounter. I've got a funny story about that, but but it, it, go, it does go lean a little it. to one side. <laughs> go for it. I, you know, well, well, when I when I played for uh, I was uh, play at the uh, well, Trump International Golf Club in in New Jersey. Okay. And this was this was during the election, uh, early in the election. It was the, the day that the the Trump was in trouble a little bit for for making the comment about Megyn Kelly bleeding from somewhere. Oh. Uh, remember that controversy? So, uh, so I was there, yes. and I, I was hired to play at a, a uh, bonfire as entertainment for, like, a marshmallow roast. It was a you know, big, big thing, but it was you know, kind of very casual around a bonfire for kids. There was going to be a, a movie afterwards. And uh, I, when I got there, I saw that there was a golf cart that said reserved for Mr. You know, for Mr. Trump. Uh, golf, cart number, you know, golf cart number one, it was labeled number one. And I was taking a picture of it, and as I finished taking a picture of it, he walked out of the building, got out of the golf cart, waved hello, and drove off. So I was, I was like, oh, my gosh, I, he's here. And I figured he came there because he was kind of avoiding the press that day, and they couldn't come on his private property. So, But I figured he's not coming to a bonfire. So I, uh, <laughs> I, I go and I, I, I set up. I started to play, and sure enough, about three songs in, he drives up in a, in a golf cart with a little girl, I assume his granddaughter, in, in the car in a little cart, and he listens to two or three songs, and he gets up on stage and says, this guy's fantastic. We're, I, you know, one of the best musicians I've heard here, and shakes my hand, and the crowd all applaud, and I couldn't say anything terribly rude because I had 200 children in front of me roasting marshmallows, so I started to play uh, some songs that are typical for campfires. So I played uh, uh, You're So Vain, Mexico <laughs> by James Taylor, Crazy by Seal, uh, You're a Rich Girl and You've Gone Too Far <laughs> by Hall and Hose. Oh. Um, what would I say? Oh, uh, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, uh, Only the Good Die Young. And then a, a gentleman came up and started asking for a request. And I thought to myself, you're going to ruin what I'm doing because I'm really enjoying this. And he said, excuse me, sir, can you play the gambler? And I was like, yes, I can. <laughs> so I played oh, the shit. Nobody seemed to be any the wiser. At the end of the show, he, uh, he, he or not at the end of the show, but about, you know, but, Four songs before he left, he came up and, and told the audience again, this guy is fantastic. And I played some originals, too. And he, and he said, uh, we're definitely going to have to have him back. And he shook my hand and he took me aside and he, and he opened his wallet and said, uh, he gave me $40 and said, yeah, you're fantastic. You have to come back again. Now, I live with an immigrant from El Salvador as a roommate. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I, I took the $40 and I gave it to my, my, uh, my roommate and said, this is $40 directly out of Donald Trump's wallet. And I think you should have it. That yeah, was my performance. Never mind. I, that I was my performance for Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, yeah, no, never mind. I'm not going to 
I don't want to take it any further because right? I don't I don't need guys in the suits coming and visiting me at the house. But they were all songs that were perfectly appropriate for a campfire. Yes. No, but what I what I had in mind that we won't go any further with that. <laughs> uh, but uh, my mighty magic stick it's coming out May ninth. MarkAaronJames.com and he's on social media all that all that fun jazz. Get everything at the website, including the music. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you so much. No, I don't prance, damn it, I'm galloping. And there might be blood on my horn. And I'll grant you a wish, darling, you got your wish. You're with a badass unicorn. I'll tell you what's up. Based out of Atlantic City, New Jersey, Geek Time Entertainment runs exclusively along with different events in the area to strategize with their partners who will benefit with increased exposure and patron traffic. Geek Time Entertainment will work with your event in increasing the event's traffic via social media, radio, and storefront advertisements. Holy cow! Also, they will help increase business for your company and event with different sales incentives. Duh. Whether your event will be small or even mid-scale, Geek Time Entertainment is the group to work with. That's what I'm talking about. Contact them today at geektimeentertainment at gmail.com or facebook.com backslash geektimeentertainment. Oh my god, who the hell cares? Hey, this is Bruce Pritchard, and you're listening to Crazy Train Radio, and don't ever forget, I love you.